You look how the world changed because of two bullets. One for dad, one for Pope John Paul. Mm -hmm. Both men thinking that they were saved from an assassin's bullet for a bigger purpose. And my dad believed that, absolutely believed it. To many Americans, Ronald Reagan was known as the great communicator and a leader who brought an end to the Cold War. He was a president whose accomplishments domestically and internationally echo through the decades and still impact our lives even today. But Mr. Reagan's legacy and life were nearly cut short when on March 30th, 1981, a lone gunman shot and critically wounded the president as he exited the Washington Hill. In the hours after the assassination attempt, Reagan clung to the one constant in his life that had always sustained him, his faith. To truly understand the roots of Ronald Reagan's deeply held faith, we visited the definitive source of information on our 40th president and the library that bears his name. But while notes and historical artifacts can help paint a picture of who Reagan was to the American public, it's his friends and family who knew him best. Michael Reagan is a son of the former president and he joined us at the Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California to talk about his father's character, faith, and the day he nearly lost his dad to an assassin's bullet. What do you remember about that day? What was it like for you? What was it like for your family? Take us back to that day. Yeah, that day I was, I was at my office. It was, you know, I always had Secret Service with me. And Mike Ludi was my agent in charge that day. And I was in a business meeting in my office. And Mike knocked on the door and came in, said there's been an assassination attempt, everything's okay. And he closed the door and walked out. And you kind of go like, everybody's looking, what? Excuse me? I walked through the door and said, Mike, did you just say there was an assassination attempt and everything's okay? Yeah. Then why don't I feel right? I, and I had, I just didn't feel right. So on March 30th, 1981, Ronald Reagan is walking outside the Washington Hilton in Washington, D.C. He'd only been president for six to eight weeks. Spoke to an AFL-CIO union audience. It's 2.25 p.m and he walks outside, lifts his left arm up to talk to the press, say something to the press. And standing there in the shadows is John Hinckley with this 22 revolver shooting 22 devastator bullets designed to explode on impact. Reagan was shoved into the back seat of the car by Jerry Parr one of the Secret Service. Parr landed on top of Reagan, closed the door immediately, yelled to the driver, go, 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 let's get out of here. And he's laying on top of Reagan. Reagan said, Jerry, get off of me. I think you've broken one of my ribs. So Jerry Parr propped up Reagan and he looked. There were these like frothy blood bubbles coming out, out from his lips, which to, to Parr said, that's a lung puncture. That's a puncture wound. And he immediately ordered the driver go straight to George Washington University Hospital right now. That snap decision probably saved Reagan's life. I picked up the phone and I called the White House and asked for Nancy. Nancy wasn't at the White House. I walked back out to Mike Lee. I said, my dad's been shot. No, he hasn't. He's fine. I said, if he was fine, Nancy would be at the White House waiting for him to come home. She's not there. She went somewhere in a hurry. We'll check. They were wheeling him up to the operating room. He saw Mike and Jim and myself all there. And he looked up at us and he said, who's minding the store? <laughs> and that was pretty typical of him. He was kind of joking with people all the time, even though he was in a great deal of pain, uh, we later learned. Reagan sitting there, laying, laying on his deathbed, praying for, for the young man that had shot him, of all things. 
And Louis Evans, the pastor, told me, he said, Ronald Reagan told me, he said, I had this powerful sense that if I didn't forgive the person, that, that God was going to take me. So almost like his survival at that minute was conditional on, on forgiveness. And he said, so I stopped at that moment and I prayed for his soul. And he said, isn't that the meaning of the lost sheep? We're all lost sheep. So I prayed for this confused young man, as he put it, and for what he did. I mean, imagine this. That moment in time was incredibly important for the president because I think he had always been a person of faith, but this was an epiphany. This was a moment where he was absolutely convinced that he had been spared for an incredibly important purpose. Um, and spared uh, by God. He, he had a reason, a very focused region for living, and he wrote about it, uh, he acted on it, and he wrote quite specifically um, that this moment has ch had changed his life forever as president, and he knew he had a purpose. Whatever happens now, I owe my life to God and will try to serve him in every way I can. Service was a common theme for the president, both before and during his time in office. Even in the months leading up to that fateful March afternoon, Mr. Reagan had been asking his team to coordinate a meeting with Pope John Paul II. The president knew the pope was a staunch anti-communist, and that if the United States was to be successful in bringing down the Iron Curtain, they would need an ally who viewed communism on the same moral plane. Leaders in the Soviet Union, however, had other ideas. On May 13, 1981, just two months after the attempt on Reagan's life, Pope John Paul II was shot twice and nearly killed as he drove through St. Peter's Square outside the Vatican. The lone gunman, a Muslim Turk, had been hired by Soviet military intelligence with one clear goal in mind, to eliminate the Pope. Like Reagan, though, the Pope miraculously survived, and the meeting that followed between the two men would go on to create the framework that would bring about the fall of communism in Eastern Europe. So the shootings derailed their attempts to meet, but they did meet for the first time at the Vatican, June 1982, alone in the Vatican Library for about an hour and they said to one another that they believed that God had spared their lives for a special purpose, which was to come together to defeat atheistic Soviet communism. That's what they committed themselves and their teams at the White House and at the Vatican to do. They became two utterly crucial Cold War partners in the defeat of atheistic Soviet communism. Ronald Reagan knew his faith would play a crucial role in defeating communism, and that maintaining a close communion with his creator would give him the vital strength needed to complete the Herculean task that lay ahead. There was no place he felt he could do that better than his retreat in the mountains of Southern California, Rancho del Cielo. Reagan's favorite spot in the world was his ranch in California. And if you've been to that ranch, I've been there many times, you can see the ocean and the islands off into the Pacific Ocean from the ranch. It is really, truly heavenly. And Bill Clark described it as Reagan's open cathedral. And he said that Reagan could really connect to God and creation through that ranch. The ranch, if you go visit, uh, embodies to me two key principles, freedom and frugality. The frugality is the ranch home, and the guy from the Midwest raised with next to nothing, where even in his bedroom, you'd think a guy who was a movie star or president would have some grand home. It's a small home. Gorbachev and other world leaders were surprised with that. Even the bed frames are two twin beds tied together with zip ties. This is a guy who lived his life the same way all the way through from a young man all, all the way through his, when he returned to his maker. But at the same time, the freedom, 688 acres of wide open space up at the top of a peak looking at the valley on one side and the ocean on the other, um, all these miles and miles of, of, of trail that he cleared himself to ride out on his horse. Why did he love it? It was freedom. And I think in many ways it was a metaphor for his love 
uh, for the American people, his belief that America was this untapped land with this untapped potential for the American people. And, and you could see it in the way he lived as well. One regular visitor to the ranch was Bill Clark, a longtime friend of Reagan's who served in multiple roles during the president's two terms. While riding on the ranch, the two often spent hours discussing what they believed the Lord had in store for the both of them. They talked about uh, the, the, the DP, the divine plan. Clark had an acronym for everything. <laughs> but he and Ronald Reagan, Reagan had this strong sense of God's providence that he got from his mom. And he would say all the time, well, this happened, surely this happened because God willed it this way. This must have been part of the DP, the divine plan. And Reagan and Clark would sort of muse about an event that happened. And, and, and Clark would say, Ron, do you believe that? And, and, and Reagan would say, well, Bill, must be the DP, must be the divine plan. So they talked about that all the time. They internalized that language, the DP, the divine plan. Rancho Del Cielo is filled with memories of Reagan's time there, including items that harken back to his childhood, where the divine plan really began. Reagan was really formed from, from youth, his, in terms of his religious views, by two people. His mother, Nell Reagan, and then there was the pastor, Ben Cleaver. Nell had the most popular Sunday school class at the church. One of them was run by a young Ronald Reagan, a teenage Ronald Reagan, who continued to teach the class even when he went off to Eureka College. Nell was the one who was really on fire for the faith, and I think more than any other made Ronald Reagan a Christian. She was that important to him. She almost died from the influenza epidemic about 100 years ago now. It would have been the winter of 1919, 1920. She very nearly died. And had Nell Reagan died, I don't think Ronald Reagan would have been president. While Nell's influence and character played a crucial role in her son's development, so too did the book she gave Mr. Reagan during his childhood. Andrew Coffin is vice president and director of the Reagan Ranch Center in Santa Barbara and is an authority on the former president's life and legacy. So Andrew, at the ranch there are a number of books. The president, as we know, is an avid reader. Mm -hmm. But there are a few books in particular that really kind of help determine the course of his life. And right. we wanted to talk with the two most important ones with you now. What are they and why are they important to the President Reagan? So the ranch bookshelves, uh, all original, the books just as he left them. Um, and they reflect the wide variety of his interests, books on sports, books on the West. He was a lifelong fan of the U.S. Cavalry, joined the reserves as a young man. Um, but there really are two books, as you say, that stand out uh, because they had such a profound impact on his life, and he refers to them throughout uh, his whole life. Uh, the first is a book um, that played a pivotal role in his childhood, that Printer View Dells by Harold Bell Wright. It was a book given to him by his mother. Uh, he read it as an 11-year-old boy. At that moment, for the young Ronald Reagan, here he reads the story of a kind of a wayward boy uh, whose mother passes away, uh, unlike uh, Ronald Reagan, but like Ronald Reagan, whose father struggles with alcoholism. And um, he's sort of drifting along uh, and walks into a church looking for a job, uh, is taken under the wing of a, a gentleman who hires him as a printer, um, and eventually comes to faith and really comes to a sense of calling, uh, the sense that there's a divine plan, as Ronald Reagan would refer to throughout his life, the DP. Um, that sets him off on a course uh, where he is uh, becomes a prominent uh, and influential community member uh, and then is eventually elected to office and uh, heads off to Washington DC to represent uh, his community. So you can immediately see the echoes uh, in that story, the fictional account written by Harold Bell Wright and what would become Ronald Reagan's own life. Um, so Ronald Reagan uh, reads the book, uh, finishes it, walks over to his mother and says, I want to be like that man and I want to be baptized. Ronald Reagan was baptized a few, uh, a few blocks up the road at the church right there in Dixon. And what's amazing is sometimes when people in politics talk about their faith, 
you wonder, is this really the case or is it the setup to try and appeal to a certain segment? That book and that influence started in Dixon as a young man. If you go to the ranch and you look at the ranch, even after he was president of the United States, up on the wall in the ranch, you see a book like Witness, a book that talks about someone's transformation from a communist in a country filled with atheists uh, to someone who comes and makes that total transformation uh, over to, uh, to being a Christian and understanding the importance of freedom here in the United States. Those were the things that influenced not just Ronald Reagan's faith, but really influenced his decision making as governor and ultimately as president. Despite the pressures and demands of his presidency, Reagan often thought of attending church, something he did regularly before being elected, but resisted because he feared doing so would put others in danger. I flew on Air Force One with my father to come out to Point Magoo. He would go to the ranch, I would come home. And uh, as, as we were landing at Point Magoo, he looked down at his fingers and he counted out number nine. I said, what is important about the number nine? He said, nine more months, I'll no longer be president of the United States. I said, why is that important to you? He says, it's important because I can once again start going back to church. I said, you haven't been going to church? He says, no, Michael, I haven't. He says, ever since I looked out the rear window of that limousine, March 30th, you know, 1981, and I saw people laying in their blood because of bullets that were meant for me. I have not wanted to put other people in harm's way at church or what have you. So I have not gone to church on a regular basis because I want to be protective of those people who are visiting with their Savior. And so I'm looking forward to once again being able to visit with my Savior on a, on a Sunday morning. Well, there was no question that he was a spiritual man, but it was very interesting. He was not one who wore it on his sleeve, as they say. Uh, he was always very careful not to try to uh, impress people about his religiosity or that sort of thing. And he never wanted people to think he was using religion or his personal faith for political purposes. But he had a deep faith, which revealed itself in a number of ways, just there was no hidden uh, aspect of his personality. What you saw was what you got. That was a person of great, great friendliness, great cheerfulness, uh, great generosity, a person who was, in the best sense of the word, a good man. He was the kind of person who literally uh, could light up a room when he walked in. God and I have had conversations, some you listen to, some you don't listen to. But the best one I listened to was in how many of us, how many of us blame our parents? And my dad never said he loved me, so the heck with it, I hate you too. And I was in church. Jack Hayford was my pastor. Phenomenal man, he was mentoring me. Uh, and uh, Jack, uh, and, and so I was in church and I, I kind of said, you know, God, if you can get your, my dad to tell me he loves me, I'll serve you. And like this voice came back and said, well, when was the last time you told your father you loved him? And I realized in 1990, 91, I had never told my dad I loved him. But I was mad because he had never told me he loved me. And so the voice said to me, well, the next time you see him, you give him a hug and you tell him you love him. God is the center of our lives. The human family stands at the center of society. And our greatest hope for the future is in the faces of our children. In American Life, I was doing a radio show at the time. I invited him to do my radio show. When he came in, I fulfilled that promise. I went up with my dad, I put my arms around him, scared him to death. See, he looked at Secret Service like being attacked. And I, uh, I gave him a hug and said, Dad, I love you. You know what my dad said? Well, I love you too. I thought to myself, oh my God, all these years, that's all I ever had to do was tell him and I would have gotten it back and I've held that against him. 
in so many ways and against God and everybody else. And we began a relationship that every time I saw my dad from that point forward, I would hug him hello and hug him goodbye. No matter where we live, we have a promise that can make all the difference. A promise from Jesus to soothe our sorrows, heal our hearts, and drive away our fears. You think about Ronald Reagan and some of his, his soaring rhetoric, it comes from the Bible or biblical references. That, that shining city on the hill, that's America. You talk about the beacon of hope and opportunity that people from all over the world come to the United States. That comes right out of, uh, right out of the Bible and, and many great books about it. This was someone who fought communism from his very earliest days, long before he ever decided to run for office. Not just because it was a failed political policy, but because it was built on atheism. It was built in a disbelief or, or a sense of trying to push religion out of, the, out of the marketplace, out of people's homes and out of people's lives. Yes, let us pray for the salvation of all of those who live in that totalitarian darkness. Pray they will discover the joy of knowing God. I remember one of the times, I think they were in Air Force, or not, a Marine once, the helicopter. Uh, but, but him reminiscing about talking to Gorbachev about his faith and asking if he'd been saved. Um, and, uh, you know, just thinking about what, a, on one hand, some people might say from a protocol standpoint, uh, what a remarkable thing to ask someone. But I also think um, that that means you've built a good rapport because if you really care about someone, no matter who they are, you want to make sure they're saved. And, and so, uh, While Reagan believed in praying for everyone, adversaries included, he also knew that peace was achieved through strength. But until they do, let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. Reagan felt a religious duty to oppose atheistic Soviet communism. He said that as Christians, he said this in the evil empire speech, we are enjoined by scripture and the Lord Jesus to oppose sin and evil with all of our might. Reagan didn't just oppose it because it had killed over 100 million people in the 20th century alone, but what really bothered Reagan about communism was, was as Mikhail Gorbachev put it, it's war on religion. It's war on religious, religious faith. It's denial of God. So Reagan felt that opposing communism was a moral Christian duty that was inextricably tied to his faith. We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty, the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. You are not forgotten. Do not lose your faith and hope, because someday you too will be free. This man changed the course of the world because of his courage to do the right thing, to call out evil when he saw it, not just to say something about it, but to do something about it and to act in a way to hold himself in a way that others wanted to follow. Think about this. If Ronald Reagan and John Paul II had died March 30th, May 13th, 1981, we're not even talking about any of this right now. History would have turned out completely different and not as beautifully as it turned out by the end of the 1980s. The bullets, in fact, were, were a blessing to all of us because they lived and were able to change the world because of it. If either one of them died, I would tell you the Berlin Wall would still be up. The Cold War would still be going on. But they both felt 
that they were saved for a reason. And, and that reason was that divine plan to bring, bring freedom, Christianity, bring those things to the rest of the world who were not allowed to have them in all those many, 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 many years. We are people who believe love can triumph over hate, creativity over destruction, and hope over despair. Why was he such a successful person? He was a person who had a vision. He knew where the country and where the world ought to be going, and so he was able then to develop the strategies to move us in that direction. He believed in the American people. He loved the country. And not just for the American people, but that he wanted peace for everyone. Uh, that he ultimately even offered SDI to uh, Gorbachev and to the Soviet people saying, here, I believe so firmly in this, I want a system that not only protects Americans, that it protects all of us. Again, Ronald Reagan, not just in the short term, but, but in the span of history, uh, will be the person who really presided over a change that brought down literally the, the, the fall uh, the Berlin Wall came right after the end of his term, uh, the fall of communism, the end of the Cold War. This is not some made up story. This is a guy who was bigger than life, who lived the quintessential American life. God's most blessed gift to his family is the gift of life. He sent us the Prince of Peace as a babe in a manger. I've said that we must be cautious in claiming God is on our side. I think the real question we must answer is, are we on his side? From the beginning of his life, Ronald Reagan believed that he had been created for a purpose, that he existed to serve a higher calling. His faith in God was a bedrock principle that influenced every fiber of his being and fueled an approach to politics and policy that resulted in hundreds of millions across the globe experiencing freedom and liberty for the first time. In 1994, Reagan penned a letter to the world revealing that he had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Despite the challenges that would lie ahead, his final words to the people he loved and led for eight years were filled with hope and a belief that our nation's best days are yet to come. In closing, let me thank you the American people, for giving me the great honor of allowing me to serve as your president. When the Lord calls me home, whenever that may be, I will leave with the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. You get to a point with Alzheimer's where you're worried, does he remember your name? He's talking gibberish, whatever. But when he would see me, even though he could not say my name, his arms would open up, waiting for the hug hello and the hug goodbye. And one day, Colleen and I were up there visiting my dad at the house. And, uh, you know, hello, goodbye, whatever. And we left, went over, to the, went over to the Jeep, got in the Jeep, and Colleen looked at me, she said, you forgot something. What I forget? Look at the door. I turned and I looked at the door, and Dad was standing. He had taken little baby steps from the from the house with Nancy's help, little baby steps all the way to the front door, and he was standing in the front door of the house with his arms open. He had remembered I had forgotten to hug him goodbye, and I ran back. Christ stands in the doorway every day with his arms like this. We could choose to walk away, or we could choose to embrace that embrace. He promised there will never be a dark night that does not end. Our weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. He promised if our hearts are true, His love will be as sure as sunlight. And by dying for us, Jesus showed how far our love should be ready to go. All the way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We all pray so. Though it's been over 30 years since Ronald Reagan walked out of the Oval Office for the last time, 
the revolution he began has become a permanent one. It lives on in a generation of new Americans, dedicated to liberty and the belief that there is a divine plan for our lives and for our nation. Perhaps that is Ronald Reagan's greatest and most lasting legacy of all.